You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Brad Ford. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view. How to get the plan done and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to 4, that's the number 4, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Season Butler on the show with me. She has a fantastic new debut novel. It's called Signet, and it is one of the most unique stories that I've read in quite some time. Uh, I think you guys are really going to love this book. Uh, welcome to the show, Season. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, I begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I think I've got a slightly funny answer to this question. I love um, it already. Because, um, so I, I remember as a toddler, I, I used to write before I could write. Um, like I'd sit there at kind of four years old making scribbles that I thought looked a lot like writing um, before I kind of knew how to write words or spell or anything like that. Um, and, but the first time... So I think the answer to this kind of goes down to this one moment in kindergarten. And it was the first time I remember writing something that had an impact on somebody. Um, and I don't remember exactly what the story was, but it was a Halloween story. And we were given like uh, these little construction paper books that were in the shape of pumpkins. And um, I wrote what I thought was a really cool, gripping a scary story and my kindergarten teacher was so taken aback by how dark it was I could just see her face fall in this look of like <laughs> terror um set it across her face and uh, and I kind of grabbed it back and um and went and wrote something that was a bit more um five-year-old girl um but uh I I think I think being a writer is a little bit of an ambivalent calling yeah. and that was my first taste of that so that's really funny um where do you think this darkness was coming from as a kindergartner <laughs> <laughs> i i think um my uh my, my life wasn't necessarily conventional um my dad was in the army at the time and so um we'd we'd moved um a fair little bit when, um, by the time I was five and we kind of settled back down in Washington, D.C. And so, um, so, so there was probably, I think, uh, a, a little bit of like a kid's mind adjusting to right. displacement and things not being very settled. Sure. But, um, yeah. And I think I was also just always a weirdo. <laughs> so, yeah. There's something to be said for those of us that are just just naturally weirdos <laughs> and there's, there's no making excuses for it. You just are totally. what you are. Yeah. yeah, you write it and it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really trying to place your accent. You have a really unique accent. Oh. Um, <laughs> you, you said that your dad was in the army. Did, did you guys move around a lot? Well, you said you did. But um, what what uh, what is the, what are the influences in your accent? Okay, well, uh, the main one is probably that I've spent the last 17 years living in London. Um, so so the, um, the moving around as a child uh, thing kind of finished around the time that I was five. But um, yeah, it's, it's mainly my dual US-UK thing. That's that's probably what it is. Um, um, it, I can't even hear it anymore. So um, you, well, you, you kind of you, you dip in and out a little bit on on different phrases, and, and I think that's what I was trying to pick up on. Yeah. Okay, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Guilty. Yeah. Um, so you you knew that you were a storyteller from early on, um, and that you were you were you set your hand to writing. Uh, I believe. And it's it's a weird belief, but I believe that storytellers are born that way, and that there's a gene or there's a gift or whatever whatever terminology you want to use. I think some people are just born storytellers, and then if you want to, you know, try your your hand at the craft of writing and take that storytelling thing to another level, that's great. Um, was there ever a time uh, other than that? Uh, you know, encounter in kindergarten where you just knew that this was going to be a, a destiny of sorts. That's a, that's a toughie because I've, I've always written. 
um, I haven't always wanted to be a writer, but um, but writing has been part of kind of how I manage this funny business of being alive. Um, I, so I think I'd, I'd have to think about that because there's it's also been a complete yo-yo of um, uh, should I should should I really try this or should I not or or is this actually something that's um, materially possible or you know am I actually abusing all of this paper with my terrible <laughs> prose um, uh, so I, I I can't necessarily um, point to point to a moment yeah I'll, maybe I'll let you know when I get there okay that's that sounds good um, so did you. Were there any um, teachers, adults, parents who recognized this thing in you and gave you any encouragement along the way? Yes. Yeah. I'm actually really lucky when I think back through the number of people who really took a moment to say, you should apply yourself to this or, or you know, sort of, um, yeah, g- keep on, keep it up. Um, my mother was a fantastic inspiration. Actually, both of my parents are really interesting, creative people and um, uh, always encouraged me to be uh, creative. And, but my mother in particular uh, would make sure that I had journals to write in. And um, so, yeah, she was, she was excellent. I was lucky to have some great teachers at school throughout my life. And um, when I was in my early 20s, living in London, a kind of college dropout. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, I had a fantastic creative writing teacher um, in a little class that I was taking on Saturday afternoons who encouraged me to apply for a master's degree, even though I didn't have a bachelor's degree. And um, and, and that master's program was, was great, but I wouldn't have gone for it without her encouragement. And um, yeah, and by the way, that's Joanna Pocock, whose nonfiction book Surrender just came out, and it's completely breathtaking. Um, so I, I've I've been lucky with uh, a generous smattering of guides throughout the way. Love it. Um, you mentioned journals. Uh, that your mom made sure that you had a journal. Is is that something that has been a a, a mainstay of your life? I've never been a disciplined journaler. But it's, yeah, writing down my thoughts and reflections have always been a way of uh, helping me figure things out, but also I've done a lot of traveling. And so having these records of not just the places that I've been, but the, the people, um, the, the, the sorts of archetypes and stages that I've been through as I've been to these places and having those was completely instrumental when I was writing Signet. So I went back to a lot of the notebooks and journals that I kept in my late teens and early 20s to try to get the voice of this character. There's, there's really no replacement for, uh, for, as a writer, for living an interesting life, going to interesting places, meeting interesting people, uh, and just collecting experiences, uh, is there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's um, the the phrase, um, the unexplored life is not worth living, but also the unlived life is not worth exploring. Uh, and that's one of the cool things I think about um, having had an upbringing that, that wasn't conventional and um, that some of the traditional safety nets weren't always there, but, um, but also um, the, the world was really open to a lot of things that sometimes we feel that we have to shield kids from. And um, what that's meant for me is um, a life full of strange characters and unusual situations. So that it's, uh, it's, it's been wild. Um, I know that you're also uh, not only a writer, but a performance artist and, um, and you teach. Uh, Do you, do you feel like these disciplines or these, um, uh, expressions bleed into one another? Uh, do you feel like that your 
performance art informs your fiction writing or maybe the other way around. Um, do you see where these things connect in some way? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, and in a way, the most important way that they connect for me is in the, in the places where they don't connect. Right. So, um, uh, performing and doing things that are uh, very sort of audience uh, uh, audience oriented from the beginning, um, and I find making performance compared to writing fiction, uh, it's it's much quicker. Um, it tends to involve other people um, at an earlier stage, and the moment of its unfolding is also the moment of its reception. And so there's, there's a kind of immediacy to it. Um, and part of me really loves that. And there's another part of me that wants to shut the door, uh, wants to be somewhere totally quiet and, um, and be alone for a while and um, uh, work with the kind of, with the particular kind of attention that writing demands. And um, so having both of those things in my life um, is, a, is a fantastic sort of um, complement. And then there are the times when I manage to use performance art as a, as a way of um, generating material for fiction. Like for Signet, for example, um, when I was doing research into coastal erosion and specifically houses on cliffs that are experiencing coastal erosion. Uh, I ended up doing an art residency with a um, collective that I work with in London. And we went up to a house in the north of England that was on a cliff. And um, I did a performance there that was um, me live writing from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, just right as close to the edge as you can possibly go. And um, every hour on the hour, I had to describe what the ocean looked like. And in between, it, it was just kind of constant free writing. And a lot of that material made its way into the book. So, oh, um, wow. yeah. That's so so sometimes cool. they need to sit in different corners and, and sometimes uh, they can kind of co-play. Right, right. So speaking of Signet, um, when did you begin working on this book? Uh, that it, that's an interesting question because I think I started working on it. Um, I started sketching bits about 10 years ago, but I didn't really start to pull it together as one thing um, until, uh, I guess, about um, 2011, 2012. Yeah, and um, a, a lot of the early stuff kind of had to had to fall away. Um, the, that was the the slab rather than the you know kind of David figure underneath the slab. Right. I, I really like that uh, uh, that idea of of kind of uncovering the story, the the slab, and then the the David figure under that. Um, because a lot of times that that is writing. Writing is is identifying what what is not the story uh, sometimes as much as identifying what is the story. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And um, the, uh, but, and and you can't get to what is until, uh, until you've been through some of that um, kind of pruning process. Right. So do you remember the genesis of this book? Do you remember what the first idea was um, that kind of kicked this thing off? I do actually. I was, I, I was uh, in the kitchen of a house on the Irish Sea, um, and I was listening to the the waves and the tides outside, and um, uh, BBC Radio Four was on. It's kind of the UK equivalent to like NPR, and there so there was a program on that was about coastal erosion, and I remember hearing this woman talk about how her house was um, was really um, under threat and how the edge of the coast had come so far kind of under the foundation of her home that there was a door in her house that her family couldn't open anymore because it would, it would um, 
it was too dangerous to kind of go through it and it would compromise the whole structural integrity and um, her insurance company didn't want to know about it and the local authority couldn't help and um, and and just the sense of um, of the this investment into something that's supposed to be completely solid and secure um, was crumbling in every second and there was a, a kind of sublime despair in her voice that really struck me and that's when I started to write this book. The uh, the, the thing that, that immediately um, strikes you when you open the book is that it is written in first person present tense. Yes. And which is very immediate. Um, and uh, I, I wrote a book in first person present uh, a couple of years ago. And I remember the comments I got from people were that it was so utterly raw in places that it was so close. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is that a challenge when you're writing that that um, that you become too close to the story? Um, sometimes if that makes sense, does it mm. is, you, you know, you're you're in. In first person past tense, which most books are written in, or even third person, there's a safe distance from there. I'm either telling something that already happened or I'm telling something that happened to someone else. By mm. by telling it presently, right now, um you you can get really sucked into that. What what's the experience as a writer of writing from that perspective? Yeah, I I I found it a real challenge, um and very emotional. Um, and, and I don't know if, if this is what made it difficult to actually do the work on some days, or if it's, uh, writing that's just hard to do on some days or, uh, some kind of character flaw of mine. But, um, I, I found it hard to face at times. Um, and so I'm really glad that you ask that actually because yeah that was an experience that I had I gave the character uh I think to my ear a slightly different accent than I have um so that she didn't sound like me in my head right and I um I I have a very kind of clear picture of what she looks like and she definitely doesn't look like me and um so 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 I did use sometimes distancing techniques um, or I would uh, if I was writing a particularly difficult scene at times I would um, listen to like very noisy like kraut rock um, almost <laughs> to almost to kind of um, uh, drown it out in a way uh, as I was writing it so yeah I did feel at times that I, I needed to soften uh, that that proximity the the story about coastal erosion that you told us just a minute ago on on BBC Four, um, that that thread of the story uh, is is definitely uh, present in the book, and and that is a um, a plot point, uh, if you will. Uh, but there's so much more going on in this book. There's uh, more than just the kind of big earthly ideas, uh, if we can use that term of of what's going on in the physical world. Um, but there's also uh, some some very deep emotional stuff going on here. Some f- very strong metaphors uh, of coming of age, of family connections, and and uh, just understanding who we are and what our mm. place is in the world. Um, how did those themes start uh, coming out for you in the writing? I think that there there was a a question that I heard bubbling up um, in in the kind of um, mid noughties um, in literary circles, kind of where where's the where's the realist literary fiction that's about climate change and um, the ecological catastrophes that we're facing, and um, and the, the literary responses uh, had mainly come from kind of young adult novels, from science fiction or fantasy. Um, And of course, there were other books that started to come out, like Ian McEwan's Solar. Um, But I I definitely felt like climate change was a preoccupation of mine that was 
asking for attention. And, um, and so this was um, my attempt to write a novel that's, that's situated within our contemporary uh, kind of existential um, moment, but which also didn't seek to distance it into um, the global south or, um, or into the future, but rather uh, I was looking for a way of telling the story of the, the consequences of ecological collapse that were uh, close to me and, and close to where I am in space and time. Um, so that was, that was part of the choice of the first person present tense. And then the other elements that come into that are, are the politics of who's most vulnerable, um, who's going to uh, suffer first and worst. And uh, of course, it's been um, communities in the global south and um, the formerly colonized world, uh, but also um, uh, poorer neighborhoods within the global north, um, people of color, women, and um, and so issues uh, like climate change, um, addiction, um, uh, workers' exploitation, um, sexual trauma. Um, you know, these these things do all have um, implications in terms of race and gender, uh, class, uh, age, of course. And so, those I I, I wanted to situate this story very much. Uh, within the reality of a vulnerable person. Gotcha. The um, the the main setting for the book Swan Island is a really interesting construction. Um, not only um, its its place and and the things that threaten it physically, um, but the the ideas of the people that are there um, and and how they find their place in the world uh, kind of emotionally and um, uh, kind of societally. Um, what's the idea behind Swan Island and the people there? Yeah. Um, so Swan Island came out of uh, my slightly geeky interest in intersectionality and um, critical race studies, and but also um, – uh, yeah, my my interest in social constructs of difference, and I, I think often we see representations of uh, marginalized people kind of against a dominant group. Uh, what I'm also interested in seeing, though, is uh, are, are situations where kind of two marginalized groups. Um, meet each other and, and what sorts of social negotiations have to happen then. Um, and furthermore, there's the idea of um, a separatist culture as a strategy for dealing with marginalization. And so on Swan, we have uh, people who are over 65 who just don't want to have anything to do with a society that says, uh, once you're old, you're uh, washed up, you're stupid, you're sick, you're invisible, you're no longer uh, sexy or interesting, or you have to pretend that you're much, much younger and embody all the traits of somebody younger. They've said um, just no to all of that and uh, have created their own space. So I thought it would be really fun to see what kind of, or, or to imagine rather, uh, what kind of space people might construct where there were free of the kind of stereotyping and over-determining narratives that mainstream culture has for them, but also how people with, um, with different kinds of marginalization within the mainstream uh, can, you know, kind of negotiate those dynamics. And so you've got a, a young person who's, you know, who doesn't yet have voting rights or, you know, kind of full citizenship and, uh, and an old, a group of old people who are dealing with a diminution of social capital in a different way. So yeah, that was, um, that's where that was all based. 
Well, it it really becomes this really fun metaphor um, for uh, you know the the way we interact with others and the way that we all have tendencies to to separate in in some ways. We all want to find our uh, our people, our tribe. We want to yeah. find places where we feel comfortable, where we fit in, where we can be ourselves. And the the uh, you know the first thing you think when you, when you start describing this place is okay. This is this is a metaphor for uh, you know separatist culture, and we are not them, and we are better than them, or you know you, you, all these things that that first come to mind. But then you start peeling the layers back, and it's just not that easy. It's oh well, these mm-hmm. people have have hurt also. And, and they're trying to find their, you know, their place in the world. And it, it really becomes complicated, which, you know, like all human uh, interaction and human nature, it's, it's very complicated. Things are rarely what they seem on the surface. And it, it really is a fun, um, exploration of kind of looking at, at our own prejudices and our own, uh, judgments that we make on people on the surface. And, um, it, it's, it's really a brilliant thing. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, the way that you constructed Swan Island and the people there. Uh, it, it, oh, thanks. it has made me stop and think on, on more than one occasion. Oh, fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. I, um, I, I was interested in, in some of the ways that, um, Older people, yeah, can really get stereotyped in various narratives. Um, I was in a creative writing workshop once, and um, somebody was writing a a grandmother who was very much a kind of flat pack cardboard cutout of a a grandmother. And um, my, uh, my teacher in that workshop, the really brilliant Tessa Hadley, was making the point that, um, you know, uh, th- this person would have uh, would have been the burn your bra generation. Um, you know, th- uh, she could have been at Woodstock. You know, hanging off Led Zeppelin's helicopter. And um, <laughs> you know, but but what's more than that is um, she she's a person and um, and and a character. And so when we make decisions about how much flatness or roundness a character needs. Um, you know, kind of stereotyping is this uh, very tempting tool. Um, so I was hoping to um, not, not even circumvent that, but but actually to, in some ways, expose it. Right. The the book is also, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, definitely a story about family and um, the, the the things we inherit, the and 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 the things that we have to make. Um, what what do you hope people um, learn, or or, or th- that you leave them thinking about family at the end of the book? Uh, I think that that families are made up of individuals and that everybody is carrying their stuff. Um, And so while we have these kind of archetypes of mothers and fathers and grandmothers and kids and, you know, on and on, um, uh, actually your mother and father are people and they live with, uh, with, a history they live with uh, their their politics and what kind of politics society puts onto them, um, and that um, I think that the condition of uh, loving people, which I guess we can think of as uh, as, as some kind of a bonding uh, agent within the family. Um, Okay, so just to be a little bit of a hippie about it, yeah, yeah. That, um, all, all attachments come with suffering, um, and so so I I think that um, what we have to in the end think about is how we relate to that kind of attachment and how, how we learn to see each other as people. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Um, the book is called Signet, and when people are hearing the show, it'll be out available everywhere. Um, 
Susan, th- this is such a powerful book. Um, are, are you working on anything else uh, now that this is out in in front of the world? Uh, yes, yeah. I'm I'm at the I'm in the early stages of the next novel. Excellent, great. Um, if people are just learning about you and want to kind of dig into all the stuff that you do and follow along with news coming up, is there a place they can connect with you online? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, I'm on seasonbutler.com. Um, you can also find me on Twitter and um, I'm giving Instagram a whirl, although I'm not a fantastic photographer, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why Instagram is there, to take all of us not great photographers and, and uh, give us a voice to you. Yeah. yeah. Look, it's my foot. It's a cupcake. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Season has been so much fun talking about the book. I'm a big fan. I love what oh, you're doing, you. and we're going to send everybody to see you. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so yeah. much. Great to speak Thank to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. On Walpurgis Night, when the moon is high, Hell's bells ring and witches must answer. They dapple their breasts with rendered fat of murdered babes, straddle their brooms and take to the sky, as the devil wills, to speed through dreamy midnight air to the summit of the Brockenberg, that haunted peak shrouded in swirling mists, where a glen of gnarled limbs and wan moonlight awaits to host their debauches and blasphemies. Now to the brock and the witches ride. The stubble is gold and the corn is green. There shall the carnival's sabbat be seen, and the devil shall come to preside. The accuser elopes from the bowels of hell, a sure-footed, goat-headed, many-horned beast with cloven hooves and a staff of bone. He perches upon the witch altar to brood in cerulean half-light, a winged silhouette with watchful red eyes. The witches gather and bow to their master. Upon his charred rump give the shameful kiss. Then imps beat the drum and a round dance begins. Lash yourselves into frenzy, hags. Pass the chalice of pure marrow broth. Whip the ground with your hair. Tread the sky with your feet. Dance with joined hands around Satan's cold fire. Then find out a nook of nettles and moss, and lay with the rough-skinned beast of your choosing, suckling some rancid teat of desire. But hist! The cock crows. Away, away! Gather your tatters and broomsticks and wits, back to your huts, to your thresholds and hearths, and become once more, at the red break of day, the furtive adder in your neighbor's garden. The ghost host of the Salem Sorcery Tour Dazzling in his steampunk Victorian morning crepe, let the spell he'd woven trail through the twilight air like a hag across the moon, then chirped, Isn't that silly? And bowed, sweeping the wet grass with his satin-ribboned top hat. The tour group gave a polite round of applause. Nobody believes that stuff today, but the Puritans sure did. They took witches very seriously. If they went down in the morning and bought eggs, and one was rotten, surely the devil had come in the night, gone boop, tee-hee-hee, then scampered off on his little hooves. And who's in league with the devil? Witches. We're taught that the Puritans were super nice and cute with little buckles on their hats, but it's not the case, folks. They were fanatics. Witch hunts don't happen in a healthy society. They hated kids. They hated women. They were crazy, and that craziness. He turned on the spot, casting a protective circle around the stone garden of the witch memorial. Got these people killed, 